So my name's Ian Sherman. I'm lead engineer at Bot and Dolly, which is a small firm in Potrero Hill in San Francisco um, that uh, is working to bridge um, the fields of robotics and some sort of non-traditional domains. Um, so uh, I think at the heart of it, what we're trying to do is build tools um, that let a broader audience harness some technologies that um, to this point have been largely behind closed doors, um, behind uh, the doors of warehouses and factories, um, and uh, inaccessible um, due to a combination of uh, 1980s looking HMIs like you saw in the last presentation, um, and uh, market fragmentation among robot vendors, um, lack of common languages in the sort of automation technology world, and lack of interfaces designed for anyone except specialized engineers. Um, so I'd like to talk about a little bit about what we do, what, what, uh, what our bread and butter is, what we're working on that, that's kind of new, and then a little bit about what we see. Um, and I think we're looking at things from a slightly uh, different perspective as, as a relative newcomer um, to the field compared to an institution like SRI. Um, so a little bit about our origin story. Um, we actually spun out of a more traditional uh, film production company. Um, there was a small group of employees uh, at a company called Autofuss that was interested in um, innovating in the, in the world of motion control, which is sort of a, a subfield within the filmmaking industry um, related to moving things around the set. Um, so traditionally, this is done with uh, you know, grips moving dollies, right? That's where the word dolly in our name comes from. Um, or it might be done uh, with uh, various one-off custom um, flying rigs um, that they would use to make Star Trek, things like that. Um, Star Wars, um, but uh, some employees at the firm saw you know saw an opportunity uh, to innovate because really not much had been done um, uh, in the 2000s, and uh, their big idea was to get one of these industrial robots off of eBay, uh, start to figure out what it could do in terms of moving a, moving a camera around, and they very quickly discovered that it made a lot of uh, heretofore impossible shots um, possible. And so uh, within a week they had four robots and they were uh, making them all move at the same time and making some really interesting things happen. So um, word got out, uh, uh, a major Hollywood uh, production company approached um, Bot and Dolly and uh, asked for our help in providing the technology for a very serious technical, um, technically shot feature film that required uh, sort of a new, uh, a new level of motion control that, that hadn't been done before. So um, this was about three years ago now. And uh, uh, for this project, we developed a platform that let us control four industrial robots simultaneously um, to move actors, very expensive actors, uh, to move 150-pound uh, lights um, that were simulating you know, the sun, um, to move uh, set pieces, to move cameras, um, and uh, to drive video all at the same time to provide real-time lighting effects, so sort of this massive project in cinematic automation. Um, and uh, with about six months of R&D, um, we were able to deliver and shoot. And uh, we came out totally exhausted, but with um, a product we were really, really excited about. Um, and the whole point was that this wasn't a one-off solution to their film. Um, this was a platform for cinematic automation. And we soon discovered um, for much broader applications as well. So. Um, a lot of what we still do today is film related, although um, by no means is it everything that we do. Um, so our sort of bread and butter is highly technical shots that require uh, the coordination of uh, camera motion control um, and other, other onset um, elements that all need to be lined up down to the millisecond, say for pyrotechnics or for high speed uh, photography, things like that. So um, I'm going to play you first. Uh, um, a sort of specific example of um, the process that we might go through when we work with a client in the film world. Um, and this gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of you know, what our day-to-day -day is when we're working on a film project. And, and I'll go into some of the things you see here. So. So just to preface, um, this, is a, uh, this was a commercial shoot for a shoe. Um, and uh, the director wanted a high-speed photography shot that wouldn't be possible with traditional motion control. Um, so we start with the director sketch, and you'll see some of the process we went through all the way until a short clip of the final product.
So you can see, you know, for three seconds of commercial, um, a decent amount of uh, work went into it. But but actually, for us, that was um, maybe about three days of preparation and then another day of shooting, um, because we're able to leverage a lot of the tools we've we've built previously. So um, in that clip, you saw um, a sort of Maya-based workflow, right? So we're very interested in using standard software that people are already familiar with for controlling robots, um, and this lets us hand over our tools to someone trained in traditional animation. Um, or filmmaking and let them immediately start moving the robots, which is really exciting. Um, uh, it lets us work in a sort of time-based manner, which is a very different uh, paradigm than uh, what is traditionally used with industrial robots. Um, and it lets us quickly import uh, different types of data. In this case, it was motion capture data, but we might be able to import geometry. We might import um, a fully rigged scene of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, 3D um, computer graphics. Um, and use that animation to drive the physical motion of a robot in a shot. So if you let your mind wander, you can quickly start to see the capabilities this would provide in a sort of visual effects um, context. So, um, so that's a lot of what we do. But, but as I said, we, we've also found that this platform is much more broadly applicable. And uh, we developed this product uh, you know, quickly under a lot of pressure and um, with a pretty interesting user base. Right, The users here were. Uh, a Hollywood director, um, someone, you know, a Hollywood cinematographer, people who had very little patience for dealing with, you know, IT and uh, were all about the visual product at the end. So I think that forced us towards some specific design decisions. Um, and ultimately what we built was, um, was about motion, right? So uh, turns out there's a lot of industries interested in motion that haven't been typically served by the robotics community. So um, in our case, uh, we've done a lot of work with the stage community, so Las Vegas shows, um, Broadway, this kind of thing, with entertainment and advertising. Um, turns out people like to see robots on screen. Um, with the architecture community that is uh, quickly opening its eyes up to the cap capabilities of, uh, of fabrication, robotic fabrication. Um, and so we're fundamentally asking the question, you know, what's possible when uh, not only can you sense in the way that the Connect demo showed us, you know, can you, can you sense to the to the precision of millimeters at milliseconds, but when you can actually actuate on a large scale, um, when you can move you know, 200 pounds at 10 meters out from the base of your robot, uh, four meters per second across the room with 0.05 millimeter repeatability. You know, this is technology that we didn't develop. It's been in factories, but what do you want to do with it? You know? So we're trying to um, give this ability to people with big ideas. Um, and uh, you know, that includes animators, drafts people, um, you know, scientists, like what would a psychologist do if they could all of a sudden uh, create motion in a room with a subject? Um, what would a furniture designer do? What would, uh, um, you know, why don't we have these in tech shop, right? Um, and I think it's because there aren't good enough interfaces to them yet. I think that's a big part of the answer. We've got water jets there, probably on the same order of cost, um, but I think we need better interfaces. So we're interested in motion, you know, not as a means to an end, but often in many cases as the end itself. So this is. You know, there's a lot of creatives who want not just to get here to pick something up, but to describe exactly how they're going to get there. Um, and so this has driven a lot of the tools we've developed. Um, so as a, as a better explanation of some of the stuff we've been working on um, that's not strictly related to film, let me show you um, a summary of some projects um, from the last couple years. So I'm an engineer by training, but I think 
what you see there is really a testament to um, the ability that what we've been able to achieve by putting our tools in the hands of non-engineers. So <laughs> I'm incredibly humbled by um, the ability to work with these people with a real visual sensibility that, that make really beautiful stuff happen with these robots. So that's very exciting to me. Um, so what do we see? I think we're in a, in a sort of unique perspective. We're not, we're not coming from an academic standpoint. We're not coming from a um, business to business standpoint exactly. Um, we're not coming from a sort of military application standpoint. These are a lot of the traditional domains of robotics. Um, so I think one thing we see is there's this whole class of technology that's ready to be released to the world, right? So uh, industrial robots is one example. They've been in factories since the 60s, 60s but really um, haven't seen, I don't know, I don't think they've realized their full potential. Um, and you know, if you think a little bit about how they were traditionally used, um, you know, they're, used, they're, they're programmed by experts. Um, they're, they're programmed to last for 10 years on an assembly line. Um, they're, they only make financial sense to be bought in large lots. Um, they can fill an entire floor. Um, but what happens if we try to disrupt that a little bit, right? So um, if we keep the hardware, which is far beyond anything that we could engineer in a small team here in San Francisco that's been under development for 30 years. Um, but we do new things with the software. Um, so what would it look like to uh, put a robot in the studio of a, um, someone doing carbon fiber layout for a, for a sale? Um, um, what would it look like to describe motion algorithmically or procedurally um, or, um, or based on geometry or based on constraints um, and not just based on point-to-point -point motion? So, um, you know, what would it look like to uh, give a motion editor to someone used to, f to editing film or to uh, give a, a welding gun demonstration tool to an expert welder and let their input program your robot? Um, so. One sort of internal demo we did of feeding our technology back into more traditional manufacturing um, is a little project we, a work in progress we call StickBot. Um, and this was an experiment in uh, connecting some um, procedural geometry software um, to uh, a robotic uh, fabrication process. Um, so the input to this product that you're about to see um, is only three things. It's the, the shape the shape of a line of a curve on, a, on the floor. Um, it's a description of height and it's a description of density. Um, and uh, from there, we're able to um, make something in the, in the real world. So here. We're very excited about you know what would customizable manufacturing look like if you could visit a website, describe a little bit about the bookshelf you want built, um, and have it delivered to you a couple days later. Um, that was about a four-hour process, um, and uh, and uh, we can draw new shapes and have it build a whole new a whole new uh, dividing wall in this case. Um, so another thing I, I think we see is is that there's sort of an opportunity for a new kind of company in this space, and I think we count ourselves among them. So. I guess the metaphor that's been in my head is, you know, there's these, you see pioneer species um, in, a, in an old growth forest that's been burned down or something, right? And I feel like we're part of this sort of secondary growth forest that is taking advantage of a lot of the substrate that's been laid by community efforts, by hardware development, um, by projects like Ross, by um, uh, the research of, you know, countless academics. Um, and I think that we'd only be able to exist if this community had sort of reached a certain amount of maturity, and I think it's getting there, and I think you're gonna see a lot more companies like us that are able to take commodity hardware, right, 
and just focus on one part of the problem and try to offer a lot of value on top of solutions that are already there. Um, so we're extremely interested in people that are not just building one-off robots, but are building things that they're willing to support and uh, releasing code that um, they're willing to support and uh, you know providing stuff that building blocks for us, right? So, um, and I think we distinguish ourselves from the from the academic approach in a lot of ways. So, um, being on set is kind of like being on a factory in the sense that when your motion control system goes down, you're losing tens of thousand dollars a minute um, with a crew of 50 people and an actor being paid a million dollars. Um, and so I think our, our approach was forged in that environment. Um, and so we're hoping to see more of uh, these, the sort of transfer from into a new type of, a new type of value add robotics company. Um, and I think my last point is we're also excited about a new kind of user for robots, right? So um, I think Tully's presentation did an amazing job of demonstrating uh, what we can do um, by providing better tools to engineers and roboticists. Um, but I think uh, OSX, for example, does an amazing job of, of showing you know, some of the benefits you can gain by really targeting a creative audience um, with your tools. Um, and uh, a lot of what we've seen on the 60 Minutes report, et cetera, is about intimidation. It's about this sort of robot apocalypse. It's this fear. I think a lot of that has to do with not, certainly, certainly with, with you know, fear about jobs, but also just a fear about control. Um, and so I think the more we can let people control these machines, um, the less scary they're gonna be and, and the better off we're all gonna be. So um, we're really excited to be part of the dialogue here, um, part of the community, um, and uh, I would be remiss not to mention um, we are looking for collaborators and You should send me an email at jobs at bottendolly.com if you are an amazing software engineer or robot-minded person. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.